Welcome to Humble Beginnings, a podcast where we uncover the unconventional, more relatable paths to success. In this show, we'll share the stories before the C-suites, board memberships, and appointments, the stories of various upbringings, first jobs, career pivots, educational uncertainties, and more. This is the place to hear about their lives from the GovCon executives themselves. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Humble Beginnings. I'm your host, Amanda Ziede, and our guest today is Jack Jackson, Vice President of Human Resources for DCS Corporation. Thank you for being here today, Jack. Thank you, Amanda. Of course. So let's start, as we typically do on this podcast, with your upbringing in Baltimore, Maryland. I know you're from a big family, a big Catholic family, one of nine, I believe. So what was life like growing up? Uh, it was a little hectic being uh, one of nine. I'm the eighth of the nine, so I was kind of down the ladder a bit. It was so much fun, so much activity, and uh, still have all close relationships with my siblings, and it really built a close-knit environment, a close-knit family. And what did your parents do? My dad was a, uh, a sports writer uh, for the Baltimore Sun Papers, and my mom was kind of stayed home, as you imagine, with with nine kids at, at that time, but she was also a nurse at times. So uh, there were times when uh, kind of to make ends meet, she would uh, work kind of a night shift. And with my dad's uh, being a sports writer, he was also somewhat working a night shift um, with his hours. Um, so it made it very difficult at times. So I think she only was able to do the the nursing uh, when some of my uh, siblings were older and they, they could look after the younger siblings. Makes sense. Yeah. So did did you work throughout your childhood or young adult years at all? I, I sure did. Um, you know, just to have some spending money, especially I uh, started out as a uh, newspaper delivery. Um, and it, I, I'd like to say it's one of those jobs where if you, you average the uh, hourly wage, you, it might even be negative because <laughs> sometimes <laughs> uh, you had to deliver the papers, get up 5 a.m. before school. It was even especially harder on the, the weekends delivering the um, a larger paper on Sundays. And uh, the challenge was you you were in charge of collecting the money as, as well as delivering and, and some folks uh, wouldn't pay you. <laughs> so it, it was uh, kind of interesting. So I think I recall maybe the whole month making under like $30. And if somebody didn't pay you, that was less. <laughs> yeah, I had some other jobs throughout high school, uh, you know, ranging from working in a shoe store to a uh, bus boy at a restaurant and uh, all, all to help with gas money and activities that I'd, I'd like to do. Yeah, it makes sense. I can imagine in a family of nine kids, uh, that kind of extracurricular funding must come from yourself a bit. <laughs> Correct. So I understand you attended Catholic school. So tell us a bit about your educational journey and what ultimately led you to the Naval Academy. Yeah, well, it was a great, great schooling, you know, uh, not to use an old adage, but we did walk to school and some of it was uphill. But um, we, you know, we walked to school to the Catholic school, which was, uh, you know, maybe eight blocks away or so. And um, and then I went on to a Catholic all boys high school. We had a sister school that that was all girls. But I, I'd like to say, you know, the kind of the parochial education, Catholic education, what it kind of taught me the most was how to manage my time because, you know, you're taking a lot of extra courses from a, from a religious uh, standpoint, and they really do uh, put a lot on you. You know, I would say I would say I had to work hard to get the grades I got. And so it really taught me how to manage my time both at uh, prior to high school and then during the high school and made me successful to enter the Naval Academy. One funny thing about the Naval Academy, um, I kind of interviewed with the senator and I kind of got rejected and um, I, I had to had to be persistent in my pursuit of that. And I was actually lined up to go to the Merchant Marine Academy and play lacrosse there. And then at the last minute, uh, a spot came through for me to go to the prep school. So it took a lot to get there. Um, but when I was there, even though I 
didn't have the best SATs uh, compared to the rest of the class, I I overachieved. And I, I think a lot of that goes back to the um, when I was younger with the, the with the parochial schools, kind of that focus on managing your time and uh, and and really the mission orientation, trying to uh, accomplish those goals. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine that. So what did you choose to study at the Naval Academy and, and why? I chose political science. I, I think I mentioned I wasn't more engineering oriented. Most people do. It's funny when you go to the service academies, you take enough engineering courses to qualify for a Bachelor of Science versus a Bachelor of Arts. But so I chose to focus on uh, political science, which I felt was really well suited for me because it it um, kind of balance. You, you're taking courses in maybe criminal law or you're taking courses in obviously politics at the time, but a lot of focus on on writing and, and reading. And those were more my strengths. So what did the Naval Academy teach you or, you know, did it change your perspective at all about your future and what you were interested in? It certainly did. I mean, I think at the Naval Academy, you, again, you're immersed in so much and not only playing a, uh, a sport, I played lacrosse there, but just trying to balance your time. And what it what it teaches you is that you really have to be resilient and you have to rely on others, right? So you really rely on others to help. You can't do it alone because there's so much of your time is demanded that you really take advantage of, you know, and develop really good friendships and learn from others and uh, constantly try to seek out um, information uh, from others who maybe been there or maybe or, or, you know, have have more of that mindset. So if I'm struggling in a course, you know, try to lean on folks that can help you. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I can imagine there are some great life skills and and just people skills and, and everything, you know, that you can learn at a, it's a unique university experience, yes. I've heard. So, yeah. So what was your naval career like after you graduated? What did you get into? Um, I was assigned to a ship for three years. So uh, came out, did some training. And I was actually in the, what they call the supply corps part of the Navy. So you, you're still on ships, but you're actually working more in functions that support the ship. So I, I ran the payroll group, I ran the ship store operations and logistics. So I and I really got into more of a focus on procurement, purchasing and uh, in that area. And then after the ship, I was on the ship for three years, early 90s. It was kind of post Gulf War, but we did do some things in support of um, some conflict that was going on in Bosnia at the time. So I uh, spent some time at sea. And from there, I went on to a job with uh, NATO, actually working in the procurement, which is really interesting, getting exposed to uh, working directly with military officers from other countries. Although it was based in Norfolk, Virginia, um, there was a lot of foreign military officers that I worked with. And I actually got to travel a bit over to some of the commands in Italy, Portugal, England. And it was just an incredible experience to experience different cultures, uh, work with different cultures. And uh, and obviously they approach work a lot differently. So trying to learn from that. And um, it was a, a great experience. Yeah, that's awesome. I can imagine years before then you were mainly in Maryland, right? Until yes. probably after graduation. Mm-hmm. So what a cool experience to be able to see the world at a young age, especially after spending most of your time in in one place. So why did you choose? I understand that at some point during your naval career, you chose to leave. And uh, and, and where did you end up after? Yeah. And then the reason for leaving really goes back to that that family. You started having um, kids. I have six kids now, had two at the time. And I just knew, um, you know, it wasn't really conducive to go because when you're assigned to a ship, you're pretty much gone uh, 80% of the time. So 
um, just knew that wasn't conducive to kind of raising a family. And usually you make that point decision at that point uh, to get out or you stay in and retire because it's 20 years. So I was six years in and it was seemed to be the right time to, to make that transition. And again, my sk- uh, the skills I learned in the Navy really set me up well for transitioning more to uh, a corporate environment because I was doing a lot of business or, or support of the ship, right? I was doing procurement and, and some things. So from there, I, I got a couple job offers. One, ironically, was in Baltimore, a company called Allied Signal at the time. And then I got a couple other offers to do uh, some consulting, like Anderson Consulting. But I also got an offer from General Electric. And that one was situated um, in uh, Mount Vernon, Indiana. And I'd never heard of Mount Vernon, Indiana. It's kind of a corner of the state that kind of borders Illinois and um, Kentucky. Um, Fairly remote, fairly remote, the whole county, I think there's more turkeys than there are and cows than there are people. So, um, but I chose to go there because, of course, for General Electric, and I came in in kind of a process improvement role uh, under Six Sigma. And at the time, Jack Welch was, he had had some success in one of his businesses, hiring a lot of prior military uh, folks uh, that called us junior military officers. So I came in sort of under that program, and uh, and it, it was a great experience. So I, I decided to take it just, you know, with GE having its reputation and and being able to learn a lot. It, so I started there in that role, and, and, and it was a great start to the, kind of the segue to the, the corporate career. Great. I understand that you were also, you know, dabbling in getting your MBA, um, but also shifting towards HR during this time or perhaps around this time. So what led you down that path? Yeah, well, I kind of looked at the functions with G- within GE uh, on where to, to go and the coming in in a kind of a process improvement role in Six Sigma allowed me to see a lot of the different functions and inter- interact with a lot of the different functions. And as I started taking some MBA courses at a, at a local university, I ultimately got my MBA from Auburn through a distance program. But it really jumped out at me that uh, from the coursework that I was uh, the, the people side of the business really jumped out at me and really helping folks in their career, interacting with folks really resonated with me. So it wasn't easy to transition to HR because uh, the HR folks were like, well, he has no experience in HR. Um, but I was able to then do a process improvement uh, role within HR. So we were implementing a global um, HR information system, which again, allowed me to maybe travel. We were the pilot program for all of General Electric. So. From that, I kind of learned the inner workings of uh, HR, and uh, I only moved once in the Navy, but then I ended up moving four times with General Electric just for the experience. Um, So I went from that role to working in a manufacturing plant in um, West Virginia at the time. So I would just say that, you know, that transition to HR Again, relying on a lot of mentors, and I still stay in touch to this day, some of the folks that mentored me into that transition. Oh, yeah, that's that's awesome. What um, what were some of the most, I guess, influential um, memories or most, most impactful moments with those mentors that you can recall? I think it's just working through times of adversity. Um, there was times where we would have to do layoffs at the plant and... Um, while they're not fun activities, you you just learn so much through those events, and um, you learn how to treat people in kind of the best and worst of circumstances. So I think that's kind of carried through with my career, trying to help people. And and this recent COVID pandemic has been a good example because it, it's it's thrown so many different aspects at us, um, and I tend to rely back on those days on, you know, how 
I've learned it on kind of the ground floor, how to how to treat people, how to um, how to interact with people, how to lean lean on others. So, and I I have to ask because as a I study journalism as well, but I when I think about journalism years ago, it seemed so much more hands on and and less online and less digital and and less being able to pick up a phone or or a video chat to to conduct interviews and things like that. So did your father's career or the way he worked at all influence you uh, when it came to career choices or being so people focused? Certainly. My dad was kind of a jovial type and clearly a people person. And um, one of the things I really took away from my dad that he could relate to anyone. So whether it be um, the lowest role at the newspaper, he he related to everyone the same way and treated everyone with uh, with the utmost respect. Um, and his journalism career was was kind of like that. He was kind of, uh, you know, in journalism, the, you know, you have the flowery writers that get the headlines. He was never about that. He was always about covering the person uh, and wanted to know their story and uh, how he could best represent that person in his article. So he was always about the basic facts, but also that personal element uh, was always a part of his writing. And uh, he and I always recall to this day, you know, at, at his funeral, how many uh, coaches and prior players uh, came and the tributes that poured in uh, just because because of his focus. And I've tried to kind of translate that in, in everything I do, um, really focus on on the people first and the relationships. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you got into HR, you're moving around with GE. What eventually led you uh, here and to DCS Corp? Yeah, part of it was the from the family aspect. I'd mentioned I'd moved uh, four times with General Electric and it started uh, you know, impacting the kids a bit, you know, with, with the frequent moves. And so we looked for an opportunity to come to an area where we could just put down more roots. So and um, one of my mentors at GE actually came to a, a, a company here in the D.C. metro area. It was actually in home building. And so I came and had some dialogue with them. And at the time, GE was going through some transition as well. The the plastics business, which I was a part of, was being um, up for sale. And in essence, they were doing a lot of restructuring. So it, it, it was the right time uh, to move to move on and and then i so i came here and um uh spent several years with with the home builder through the kind of the, the highs and lows of of at the time because we went went through a housing crunch at the at, at that time and um and then i got into the government contracting space um after after that role um and they've been mostly focused on that since and I feel like I've some ways come full circle supporting the military. The company I'm with now, DCS, supports um, uh, the Navy a large a large part. Actually, aspects of the Navy I wasn't involved with, and um, more on the R and D side and Army, Air Force, all all the branches, Marines, all the branches, which is which is great. Yeah, yeah, that must be, feel pretty rewarding, especially having been a part of the services yourself. So. All right. So let's talk about failures a bit, because I know that those can be very humbling and we all make mistakes. But were there any moments like this throughout your career? And if so, what did they teach you? Yeah, uh, well, there was actually a funny one that occurred when I was on the ship. The ship had been over deployed for 10 months. And when I took over as the payroll officer, not only do you pay the crew, but you actually end up paying cash for things like docking fees and and foreign vendors so they decided that they um we needed another safe <laughs> on on the ship so i was in charge of procuring the safe and and getting it loaded before we went on a a, a six-month deployment and um the failure comes in in that i i failed to uh 
learned that the safe was too large to fit through the normal hatches on the ship. So, and we had to bring it down a certain way from the flight deck. And uh, so to, to cut to the chase, I, I employed, uh, I listened to the aircraft handlers, but apparently they're not good at handling safe. So the safe actually dropped uh, through uh, several decks on the ship. And um, I was kind of saved at the time because the uh, the ordnance handlers actually uh, dropped the dummy uh, missile that uh, maybe 10 minutes later. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I learned from that is, uh, you know, the attention to detail um, and uh, the fact that you do have to involve the right people and get the right counsel and, and do things. So the, I rebounded from that, ended up being... Um, highly ranked on the ship amongst the officers, but um, something like that. Uh, it was a funny moment, but uh, luckily it happened earlier in my career. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have one of those, right? Yes. Just something that <laughs> yeah. was there, was there anything, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm so curious about life on, on, um, on board and being deployed on a ship for many months were there things that you learned during that time that you pull from today, aside from this experience, of course, yeah. but yeah. I, I think, I mean, on the ship, you, um, I think it's the idea of collateral duties and, and taking on different responsibilities. So um, not only am I doing a specific role on the ship, but you all, you, you learn how to fight fires on the ship and, and, and you, you learn how I've actually learned how, even though I, wasn't a surface officer i learned how i got a qual on on learning how to drive the ship so to speak um you you learn and you learn to take on uh different responsibilities and be comfortable in those situations and you're constantly moving through different responsibilities as well and it's it's and it's learning how to lead people people that um in a lot of ways are a lot smarter than you. So, you know, uh, having, you know, in my first role as the payroll, having a chief um, who had been there 20, you know, 20 year career, and you, you learn to rely on those folks and seek out that. And I think that's kind of carried through because we're, you know, our, our, lim our knowledge is limited at times. So, um, again, it goes back to that theme of trying to rely on others, not being afraid to to ask for help where help is needed and empowering people, empowering the people under you uh, to be their best. Awesome, yeah. And I always like to ask this, ask this question near the end, but at this point in life, have you exceeded expectations or, or any expectations that you originally set for yourself at a young age? Um. It's hard to say, right? Because, you know, when you're that young kid and, you know, my world was all about kind of sports. I was immersed in sports and and certain things. So I didn't have that clear of a path um, other than, you know, knew I wanted to go to college, knew I wanted to achieve. So that's hard to say because I never really put out there that I wanted to be a VP or a certain level, and that's never really been about that. But I will say from the family aspect, I did, right? So I, I knew I wanted to have a, a large uh, a large family, and um, so that's what's been more the focus. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. My mom is one of 10, and I have a bazillion cousins, and it's so fun. Yeah, so <laughs> the, the gatherings are fun. <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. All right. So finally, Jack, any advice for young aspiring leaders in this industry or perhaps in general that you can pass along? Yeah, yeah I think it's yeah. Don't don't be afraid to ask questions and um, don't let anything limit you. Um, and uh, just keep keep working hard and and uh, and take on take on the tough assignments, take on collateral things. Like when I was on the ship, I actually organized um, kind of the morale and welfare for the ship. And just experiences like that can teach you so much because you're interacting with different groups, different different departments. So don't be afraid to just keep, keep that focus on 
developing yourself and uh, taking on different things that will develop you. Hey, wonderful. Well, Jack, thank you so much for sharing about your life and your journey, your career, your family. It's been such a pleasure learning this, uh, this part of your life. And I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank you, Amanda. Do you know an executive in GovCon with a humble beginning? We'd love to share their story. Shoot us an email telling us a bit about them, and maybe one day you'll hear them on Humble Beginnings. You can reach us at media at washingtonexec.com.